Well, hello. Today, we're starting our series on mental health and the lies we believe. Uh, January is a, is a month where many of us make goals for our physical health. So this year, we're just suggesting that, that we all set some goals for our mental health as well. If I'm honest, the pandemic, it really took a toll on the mental health really of our entire country. I recently uh, sat down with some high school counselors from this community and they said what they've seen this year is that the pandemic really has undone way more than just two years of social development and mental health in teenagers. But it's not just a young person problem like sometimes we, we want to believe. Um, if, if you've tried to get uh, an appointment with a counselor or a psychologist recently, you know that many of them have wait lists that are months long. And it just shows us that this is something that we're all dealing with, either directly or indirectly. And so what if in 2023, we all made it a resolution, whether we do New Year's resolutions or not, to be a little bit more healthy mentally? And we hope that this series will help. We hope that the resources and the small group discussions around it will help as well. But I do want to make a few things clear up front. I'm not a psychologist, and none of our preachers are mental health professionals. We're not going to pretend to be So here's the thing. If you are struggling with a serious mental health issue, if you're having suicidal thoughts, if you have constant crippling depressive symptoms, if your mental health is causing you to abuse substances or have violent outbursts or do anything to harm yourself or other people, you you should seek professional medical health care. The series is not intended to replace professional mental health care. In fact, I actually want to point out some places you can go to get help if you need it. And I know, again, with mental health specialists, a lot of their, a lot of their uh, appointments are backed up months. So while you're waiting to get in, would you reach out to your family doctor, or local, health, the local hospital, or, or community mental health services? Would you log on to our website and check out some resources we have there, some, some online mental health resources, including a list of some agencies that we recommend in this local area, that some of which offer uh, faith-based mental health services. And even if you're not struggling right now, would you log on here and would you check out these resources and share them with someone you know who is struggling? In fact, on your way out, we're gonna hand a little tag that will fit on your keychain to everyone so that you have with you close by access to our website and these resources and that you can, you can access them quickly and share them for someone if you need help. I also wanna make another just quick overarching disclaimer at the beginning of the series. I know some of the topics we're going to talk about are sensitive and and may be triggering for some people all throughout this month. I want you to know that around here, it's okay to not be okay. It just is. And if you are struggling with mental health issues, it doesn't mean you've done something wrong or you've done something bad. We all have struggled with, are struggling with, mental unhealth. Because look, our brains go through illnesses and imbalances just like the rest of our bodies do. And when our brains are struggling, we need to pay a little bit more attention to that area of health. Now, the reason we're doing this series is because when we open scripture, we see that there is a connection between, between our mental health and, and our spiritual life as well, and we think we can help in that area specifically. Um, what we see is that there are, there are some common lies that people tend to believe. And so what we wanna do is just share with you the truth from scripture. We think that that could be helpful. Now, one more thing I want you to know. <laughs> it's okay to follow Jesus and see a therapist. Maybe someone's told you differently. It's okay to trust Jesus and take prescribed medication. Really what we're trying to do in this series is is let you know that when, when, by following Jesus and restoring a relationship with your heavenly father through Jesus, that that is the foundation for healthy thoughts, 
feelings, and actions. It's not the whole house, which is why this is true, but it is the foundation. And I want you to know one more thing. This concept of mental health and the lies we believe is deeply personal for me as well. Before I worked here, I was a special education teacher for four years. And then my first job here, for eight years, I worked as the high school pastor. And so I got a firsthand uh, view of how our young people are being impacted by, by mental health. And, and even during the pandemic, how that took its toll on this generation. And mental health, specifically connected to lies we believe, is something that, that I've dealt with in my life. I went through about a decade when I was younger of, of just overwhelming thoughts and feelings that I didn't understand. And so for me, it kind of led to just an underarching, like an overarching feeling of just anger or, or hatred, if I, if I put it that way, just kind of for everything, definitely for myself. It was pointed at myself the most. So I got counseling, I was part of some peer groups and, and eventually just came to understand that what had happened is I had, had believed some lies that I was only worth anything if, if I did something that made me feel important or was only worth something if I did things that made me feel better than the people around me. Look, church, at the end of the day, I'm just a person who, like you, has struggled with and struggles with mental health because of some lies that I've come to believe. And the only antidote to a lie is the truth. And church, the truth is found in Jesus. Jesus even said about himself, I am the way and the truth and the life. Because Jesus is the truth, throughout this series, we wanna help you become aware of maybe some of these common lies you've come to believe and then guide you to Jesus. And today, my objective is to, is to explain how maybe, maybe the biggest lie that we come to believe that leads to some aspects of our mental unhealth is the lie that we are not loved. And unfortunately, we come to believe this lie for many, many reasons. Some of you have believed this lie because someone told you something or someone did something to you that made you feel like you were not loved or even made you feel like you're not lovable. For some of you, it's not something that someone said. It's that someone hasn't said they loved you. Or, or, or someone hasn't shown you they loved you in so long that how could you believe that you're loved? For some of you, your experience has taught you that there's something about you, something about your past, something about your character, something about who you are, some flaw that's rendered you not loved or not lovable. However we've come to believe this lie, when we believe that we are not loved, it opens a gap in our life. And sometimes we can't even pinpoint exactly what it is, but it makes us feel like there's something off or there's something missing or that there's this hole in our life that, that we just can't seem to fill. But we'll try just about anything to fill that gap. I mean, people have tried accomplishments, and that was kind of my thing. Substance, education, plastic surgery, relationships, diets, sex, power, money, and yet this gap remains because it's a lie that we're not loved. The truth is this is how we know what love is, that Jesus Christ laid down his life for us. The truth is that God loves you. And Jesus is the proof. Jesus Christ laid down his life for us because he loves us. And what this demonstrates is that real love, real love that you can trust is when someone puts the needs of someone else in front of their own, not because they've earned it or because they deserve it or because they have some desirable characteristic about them, but simply because they are human. Real love is when someone knows all of your insecurities, all of your flaws, all of your failures, and chooses to give their life up for you anyways. This is what Jesus did for us, and this is why. If I could, 
if I could convince you of any one truth, it's that God loves you. He showed it through Jesus and his love endures forever. And if there's something missing in your life, perhaps that gap can only be filled with the love of your heavenly father. And let me just tell you, when you are filled with the love of God, you won't be able to help yourself but to go and love others because the love of Christ, it changes us. It just does. It changes the way we think. It changes the way we feel. It changes the way we act. When we, when we come face to face with the God of love, it starts to drive out fear and angst. And in these ways, it, it impacts our mental health. And it's this real love that we can trust that is the premise of a portion of scripture that we know of as 1 John. 1 John was written by a friend of Jesus who, who was a disciple of his and, and got to know him, was an eyewitness to his death and resurrection. And he writes this about 60 years after Jesus rose from the dead. So when John writes this, he's like, getting to be a little bit older. He's like a grandpa. And he actually writes it almost from the perspective of a grandfather writing to his grandchildren. And he's like reflecting on the things that are the most important in life. And he writes it at a really interesting period of history. It's still the first century. So there are people like John who are still alive that knew Jesus when he was alive. They saw him die. They saw his, his resurrected body. And, and there's also a group of people who have come to believe in Jesus but now are denying and dismissing him. And they're going around and trying to convince other people to leave their faith as well. And so John calls these people false prophets. And he does so because he says, you're, you're claiming to speak on behalf of God or that, like you know something about God, but you're denying Jesus. And so some of the people John loves most, their faith has been rocked by these false prophets. They were seeking truth, they thought they had found it, but now they're not so sure. And I wonder if some of you can connect with that audience. I wonder if some of you at one point in your life would have said, yeah, I'm sure of what I believe, but now maybe you're not so much. So John writes to them, but, but he writes to us as well. And he writes because he wants us to know, he wants us to know that we, we can trust God's love and we can trust that it's for us. And so he says, people who really know God, they're gonna center their entire lives around the crucified and risen Jesus because it's there that God's love is, is demonstrated best. Jesus' death on the cross was God's best example of total self-giving love. And, when, and it's that love that compels Christ followers like John to go and share that with others. And look, some of you, some of you know that love well, and you only need to be reminded of it. Some of you have heard about God's love, but if, but if you're honest, you've, your experience has taught you that there's just as many disclaimers, there's just as much fine print to God's love as anyone else's. I wanna acknowledge that many Christians have gotten God's love wrong. And if someone who's claimed to know, know God has used that phrase, I love you, or has used their love for you to manipulate you or to harm you, I'm so sorry. I want you to know the truth is that God's love is for you and he doesn't require anything of you or from you. Now, some of you may not know that God loves you. Maybe that's a new concept to you. Maybe you thought overall God just is disappointed in you or or looking down on you. Let me tell you, God's love is so much better than you can imagine. It's so much better than I could possibly communicate. God loves us regardless of if we love him back. God loved us before we even knew him. While we were still his enemies, while, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. I remember uh, being in the hospital holding my son for the very first time. He was this four pound, 11 ounce, tiny little human who I would have given my life for. <laughs> Meanwhile, he doesn't know anything about me. I'm just some blurry, milkless creature. And he... 
But as he gets older and as he learns what love is, the fact that his dad loved him before he could walk and talk, before he was even born, it's gonna mean everything to him. In the same way, before we knew God, he loved us and he sent his son to die for us so that our sins could be forgiven. That's why John writes 1 John. And I wish I could share the whole thing with you, but I do wanna point out a really powerful portion starting in chapter four, verse seven, where he writes this. Dear friends, let us love one another for love comes from God. Now that phrase, love comes from God, is important. Because it tells us that the source of love, the governor of love is God, which means we can't understand a definition of love without God. It's his examples of love that actually define it for us. And God's best example of love is that he sent Jesus to die on a cross to save us from the consequence of our sins and to bring us back into a relationship with him. Love comes from God. And everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now here, John is connecting these two concepts of knowing God and loving others. He's like, look, if you really know God, like you really know him, you're not gonna be able to help yourself but to love other people. And so if you find yourself not demonstrating self-sacrificing love for others, Chances are there's something you don't know about God or something you're not understanding or something you're not believing. Now, I think a big reason why many of us struggle to know God is really because we don't love ourselves. I think for many of us, instead of trusting God's love for us and allowing that to be the thing, the thing that drives how we view ourselves, we trust how other people view us more. Or we trust what we think other people view us. And then we start to own that. And then we say, well, God probably thinks those same things about us too. I think for others of us, we struggle to know God because of the way we view other people. So when we look at other people critically or condemning or in unloving ways, we start to think those things about ourselves. And then we're like, yeah, well, God probably thinks that thing about us and others also. John here is saying, like, if you know God... (laughs) You're gonna know he loves you and you're gonna know he loves you in a way that's gonna cause you to love other people. So perhaps for some of you that your next step in knowing God more deeply could start by you sharing his love with others. My wife and I used to take teenagers to uh, Haiti on a short-term mission trip. And on the way there, we'd be like, you just wait, this place is gonna change you. It's gonna change your life. And what we meant when we said that was that there's something that happens when when something that's only been a concept for us becomes a reality, that it does something in our minds. And so for many of these young people, they had seen pictures or videos or heard stories about what a third world country is like, what Haiti is like. But when we get there and we drive through the city and they see the contrast between wealth and poverty, when they see things they had only ever heard about, this concept becomes a reality and it changes the way they think. And then we show up at our destination and we spend a week learning about this beautiful culture and these beautiful people and and we're sharing God's love with them and we're learning about God's love from them. And, And it was always interesting because my wife and I would see this light bulb almost turn on in these young people's minds all throughout the week, one at a time, when this concept of God's love as they expressed it for others, became a reality. And they were like, oh, that's what it means that God loves me. Here's the point. If you've only ever heard about God's love, but you've never experienced it, you've never been filled with it, let me just tell you, when you open up your heart to receive it, it will change your life. And if you've only ever received it, and you've not yet shared it, or, you've, or at one point in your life you were sharing it and for whatever reason you've stopped, perhaps the thing that will help you know God more deeply will be to begin to act selflessly through service and generosity to others. So who is someone today, this week, that you could show God's love to? Because our willingness to share God's love might just be the thing that opens our heart to 
to know his love for us. John goes on, he says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. It's a powerful phrase to say this is how God showed his love because it proves to us that God's love is not just words. How many of you remember uh, the first time you told someone you loved them? Do you remember the butterflies? You remember the tension? Like, are they gonna say it back? Is it too early? It is a charged sentence the first time we say it. But how many of us, over time, has that phrase lost its charge? It becomes this thing we use to say goodbye on the phone. Or we use it to mean thank you for doing something I didn't want to do, like, babe, thanks for vacuuming the floor. I love you. Or, or we use it to get someone to do something we don't want to do. Like, hey, could you go grab the mail? I'll love you forever if you do. We don't talk like that at home. I just, you know, I'm just using it as an example. <laughs> Some of us, we've used that phrase so much it's lost its meaning. Some of us, that phrase has been used to harm or manipulate us, and so we don't trust it. God didn't just say he loved us. He showed us. He saw all of our failures. He saw all of our flaws. He saw all of our sin. And instead of destroying us, he sent his one and only son into the world and allowed him to be crucified on a cross so that our sins could be forgiven and so that we could have a relationship with him. God knows everything about you. He knows everything you've done. He knows everything you were. He knows everything you've become. He knows every hair on your head and he loves you and he doesn't just say it, he showed it. He sent his son for us. John goes on, he says, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. This is another bold, almost outrageous statement. This is love. This is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us. What this means is we can't possibly know what, God lo what, what love is without God showing us. It also means this, that love is not a feeling. Love is not something you can earn. And love is not something done for people because they're worthy. Instead, love is God sacrificing for us in spite of our feelings. And in spite of our inability to earn it, and in spite of the wrong we do, God loves us because he is love. And God demonstrates his love for us specifically because we can't earn it and because we don't deserve it. So if you have come to believe the lie, that you are not loved for whatever reason, I want you to know the truth is that God loves you desperately and sacrificially. And if your experience has taught you that you have to, you, the, the way you get love is that you're, you're more accomplished or you're more sexual or you're taller or prettier or harder working or that you do something or give something to someone in order to get that love, I am so sorry, that is not love. That's something else. Church, this is love. Not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Sometimes, our mental health, our mental illness causes us to believe a lie that we aren't loved. When we embrace the truth that God loves us, it may not take away our mental illness, but it is the truth. And it's truth we can cling to in the struggle. It's truth we can hold on to when life is hard. And if there's something that feels like it's missing in your life, I want you to know Jesus loves you. And when you experience that, it, it won't take away the hardship of life, but it will make it worth enduring. And it will give you something to share and something to enjoy no matter what life brings our way. See, when we come to know God, when we experience his love through Jesus, 
It will become the thing that grounds our entire life. And it will be something that fills us up so that we are full of love and generosity for others. Regardless of if you believe the lie or not, I want you to know God loves you and he sacrificed everything to have a relationship with you. And you can respond to that love today. You could respond by receiving it. Maybe for the first time, just opening up your life and your heart to be filled with God's love. Perhaps today you can respond to this by trusting it. And by trusting it, we're saying, I'm I'm gonna begin to reorder and realign my life with the way of Jesus. You could share it. You could say, really, my next step is to respond to God's love by filling someone else up with his love. I'm gonna close out today by praying a prayer that that Paul prayed for his church family in Ephesus. When he prayed for them, he prayed that they would be rooted and established in this love, that it would be the thing that fills them up with the fullness of God so that they could be poured out to anyone they came encounter with. So I would love to pray that over us to close. Let's bow. Father God, I pray that we, being rooted and established in love, may have power together with all the Lord's holy people to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge so that we may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. In Jesus' name, amen.